And let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this bright and beautiful day. We give you thanks for this new opportunity to gather in your place, to sing your praises, to study your word, and we invite you to be present here among us. Uh, We ask that you would pour out your spirit upon us, open our hearts and our minds, open our ears that we might hear from you today, uh, and that you might change us uh, for the better. For we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're continuing our look at uh, the parables of Jesus, uh, and today we're actually going to be looking at three parables. Uh, These parables, uh, well, they were all spoken by Jesus, whether Jesus put them all together or whether uh, Matthew, uh, the gospel writer, uh, put them together. But usually when when parables uh, are are linked together like this, it usually suggests that, that they have the same theme, that that they support and uh, encourage and and define one another, uh, and they lead to one conclusion. So we'll see if uh, that actually happens for us this morning. We are in uh, Matthew chapter 13, and we are starting, yeah, uh, at 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and again hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, I have to admit to you, this is one that I have always struggled with a bit because it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. It doesn't seem realistic. Because it seems to me that human nature is such, if somebody is wandering through a field and finds a treasure. Now, understand that traditionally I have thought about this as being a treasure, gold or or gems or something of intrinsic monetary value. And generally, if somebody is wandering through a field and finds this sort of a treasure, why go to the trouble of hiding it again and buying the field rather than just taking it with you? Now, then I thought of this story. Many of you know Jane Rowley lives down the road. Uh, Her house was built in the 1800s, and her daughter one day found a man in the backyard with a metal detector. And apparently he had found a few coins in the backyard. And she asked him, you know, what are you doing here? Well, he seemed to think that the township had bought the property. And she assured him that they had not, that this was private property. And so he asked, you know, well, do you want these coins that I found? She allowed him to to keep the coins. But that got me to thinking, well, okay, certainly in Jesus' day, they did not have metal detectors. But certainly I could see if you, if you came across something that was of uh, historical significance, that was tied to that piece of land, I could maybe understand, okay, well, well I'll just put it back, I'll buy the property, and then there's no question of, of ownership here. But then I thought, well, what if this treasure is the type of thing that is tied to that spot? And what if the treasure is something that might not seem all that great to somebody else, but has value to that individual? I mean, perhaps they were wandering at the right time of day and found a nice rock and sat down and it witnessed a sunrise or a sunset. And from that particular spot, it was the most magnificent thing they had ever seen. Or maybe they were wandering through this field and they found a rare orchid. And they thought, wow, that is the most beautiful thing I've I've ever seen. And so these things may or may not have any value to anybody else, but for that person, whether it's a, a sentimental value or whether it just causes their soul to sing, they see the value. And they'd be willing to give 
whatever it cost to have that as theirs. And I think perhaps what Jesus is trying to say is that is what the kingdom of God is like. When you find it, when you truly understand the kingdom, when you truly understand what God wants for your life, you would be willing to give up everything else just to be part of it. That's really what we heard in the Old Testament scripture. Josiah, one of the last kings of Judah. Now Israel, remember after Solomon, the, the whole nation had been split into two, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Israel had already been conquered. It had already been devastated. They had already been carried off into other places. Judah was still managing to maintain their identity as a sovereign nation. Josiah was one of the last kings. And his predecessors, uh, Manasseh and Ammon, had had led them off into all sorts of horrible idolatry and uh, child sacrifice and various things. Josiah, as a young man, uh, he, he starts, I think, at age eight as king. And even from the beginning, he, he begins to start cleaning things up, to, to repairing the temple. And in the repairs of the temple, the high priest finds the book of the law. And he brings it to the king. And when Josiah reads it, he tears his clothes. And he cries out because he realizes how far from God's ideal they have strayed. How far from what they are supposed to do, they have strayed. And so he calls the entire nation back and he reads them this book of the law. And he and the people change. They make a commitment to change, to become what God has called them to be. And that chapter goes on to describe the reforms, how they tear down all of uh, the shrines for idol worship. But it causes an amazing change in them. They're willing to give up what they have known, what they have been doing, because they see what God has calls them to. And so Jesus goes on and tells another parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now this is similar to the first, but it's a little more specific. Now we know that this guy is a merchant, and he's a merchant who specializes in pearls. That's his thing. He knows pearls, and he trades in them, and he looks for, for better pearls. But then, in his search, he comes upon this one pearl. This pearl, the pearl perhaps that he has been searching for all his life. And he sells everything else. He sells all the pearls that he's collected over his lifetime. He sells everything for this one pearl. Now we could change the, the illustration. I mean, think of it this way. There's a guy and believe me, you, you can translate this into your own situation. It doesn't have to be a guy. It just is the perspective I am most familiar with. There's this guy who, who likes to date. He dates all sorts of women. Every time you meet him, he's dating somebody new. Goes through women like candy. Always saying, I'm never getting married. I like playing the field. Until one day, he meets a woman. He meets the woman. 
And suddenly he finds that his perspective changes. He's no longer really interested in other women. He has found this one woman who has made him willing to give up all others. The kingdom of heaven is like that. That when you find it, when, when you understand it, you would be willing to give up everything else just to serve in God's kingdom. The problem is that after these first two, we come to a screeching halt and slam in to the third, which seems different. Verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. And that word kind means every race, every nation, every nationality, every species. So it's all encompassing. This, this net catches fish of every kind. It has, has no prejudice. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down and put the good into baskets but threw out the bad. Now, to be honest, I don't like this translation because this is the problem. When we as human beings see those words, good and bad, we each have our own definition of what those are. How do we define what is good and what is bad? Well, in the original language, it is a little more clear because these are words that relate particularly to things like fish. The good are those that are fresh, that, that you would want to take home and cook up for dinner. The bad, that word really means rotten, foul, disgusting. I think most of us could tell the difference between a good fish and a rotten fish. And that's the thing. There's a, for God, it is obvious. And that's the other part as we see as we finish this. Verse 49, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out, of, come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now the angels are messengers. They are, they are under authority. They are sent by God. They, they are not making this decision on their own. They are just carrying out the orders of God. But that is one of the important things about this parable. It is God who judges between the good and the bad. It's not you, it's not me, it's God. He will judge between the good and the bad. But did you see the difference between this parable and the first two? The first two, it appears that we are the ones who seek and find the kingdom. In this, it is God who who spreads this net. Now you could say he, he finds, amongst all of the fish, he finds the good ones. But is it really a difference? What if all three of these are telling the same story? What if in the first two, we are not the seekers? What if in all three of these, God is the seeker? God is the one finding things. That means you are a priceless treasure. That means you are a precious pearl. That means you are a treasure which God values so much that he would be willing to give everything 
for you. Now, that doesn't negate the first meaning. We still should recognize that if God is willing to give everything up for us, we also should be willing to give everything up for him. But it changes our reason. If we really understand, and, and I think this is, this is the part of discovering the kingdom, of finding the treasure. If we really understand how much God values us, how much God loves you, that he is willing to give up everything. He was willing to give his life for you. That, that is a God I want to serve. That is a God I want to, to lay my life out for. That is a God I want to follow. And that is the God who calls you to follow him, to trust him, to seek him. There is a missionary you may have heard of, Jim Elliott. He and four other young men, uh, only in their 20s, went to South America, to the Amazon, to try and bring the gospel to cannibalistic tribes. All five of them were slaughtered by the tribe. Amazingly, two of their wives returned and were successful at bringing these tribes to know Christ. But Jim Elliot, one of his most famous quotes, is, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. All of this, your house, your clothes, all your stuff, ultimately, you don't take it with you. But if you know Christ, if you follow him, that is a relationship with no end. You are no fool to give what you cannot keep, to gain what you can never lose. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as, as human beings, our love for one another is, is limited, is, is flawed. And so it is hard for us to, to understand the incredible love that you have for us. It is hard for us as, as humans to believe that there is a God who, if he truly is God, if he is the one who created everything, if he is the one who rules the universe, why on earth would he become one of us? Why would he give himself for us? Why would he care so deeply about each and every one of us? It, it, it's hard for us to comprehend. And yet it's, it's what your word tells us. Help us to understand, at least in some small part, your love for us. That we might respond to that love. That we might share that love with others. That we might find your kingdom. 
that we might live out that kingdom in this world for your honor and your glory. And in Jesus' name, amen.